we're looking at what has been referred to as a better hope. Let's begin reading together here in Hebrews chapter 7 at verse 11. I'll read to verse 19 and we'll get into our study. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning at verse 11, reading to verse 19. The writer writes, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Now, as we begin, the writer of Hebrews has been uh, revealing to his readers that the priesthood that they had received from uh, Aaron is actually insufficient. God had established the Levitical system, but it wasn't intended to be perfect, and it wasn't intended to be permanent. Uh, it was intended to point to that which is permanent, and so what he's been speaking about is the priesthood that is permanent, and the priesthood that is permanent is not from Aaron, but rather is uh, that which is Jesus' priesthood. Now, he had been making it clear as we've been going through chapter 7 that uh, Jesus has a superior priesthood because his priesthood actually predated the Levitical priesthood by 600 years. Now, that is because he's a, after an, another order. He, he belongs to an order that is different than the priesthood of Aaron. He belongs to the priesthood according to Melchizedek, and his priesthood was presented as one that has no recorded conclusion. Now, as we're looking at this, I realize that this is foreign subject matter to most of us, and you know, it's a little difficult, I'm sure, for some of us who, especially if we're new in our faith, to really grab hold of. And what I'm going to try to do in this study is confuse you even more. I'm certain I'll be very successful at it. But I actually, as we look at this, as I'm even reading it, I'm realizing that for some who are new in the Lord, these things may not matter much to you. And you may be looking at things that can actually apply to you. This really does apply to you, but it applies in a very deep spiritual dimension. We're looking here at the priesthood of Jesus Christ, who is our high priest. And the Jewish readers, and remember this is the book to the Hebrews, you know, the Jewish readers had a reason to cling to their uh, traditions and their rituals. Jesus Christ has come in order to fulfill all the prophetic implications of the, uh, the priesthood that God had ordained for Israel to, uh, to serve under. And the Jews, as they're reading this, are saying, why should I turn away from the temple ritual and all of the laws that I have been um, holding fast to all of my life, why should I do that? What's to benefit me? What's the gain that I'm going to receive from doing so? And so here in chapter 7, uh, the writer's been saying, well, it's of great benefit to you because you need to understand something. One is you're holding fast to something that was temporary. The priesthood was not intended by God to remain and to be permanent. That priesthood that you were uh, worshiping God under, the Levitical priesthood, uh, is something that was intended to be replaced. And two, you need to remember that Melchizedek predated Aaron by 600 years. And when Abraham, who was the father of the Jewish nation, encountered him as it was recorded in Genesis 14, Abraham actually gave offerings, tithes to this great man who was a priest. And so you already have precedence in your religious history all the way back to the father of the Jews uh, to give honor to uh, a different priest, a different priesthood. That's the point that we're looking at here. So the Jewish people are saying, why should I follow after Jesus Christ when I already have a priesthood, when I have the high priest and I have all of the rites and ordinances that have been delivered to me through the law of Moses? The answer is because Jesus' uh, priesthood is superior 
even as Melchizedek's predated Aaron's, Jesus is superseding Aaron's also because his is intended to be permanent. That's what you find here in chapter 7, and it's going to go on further next time we're together. But that's the point that he's making. Jesus is a priest, but he's after the order of Melchizedek. Now, under the Old Testament law, if you were to be studying through the Old Testament, and you, you would come to the book of Numbers in chapter 8, verses 23 through 25, you would see that the priests in the uh, Aaronic priesthood actually had a time limit. They reached the age of 50, and they would retire. So were I to have been a Kohen, were I to have been a priest under the Aaronic priesthood, I'd have been retired for six years by now. And somebody here says, oh, I wish we were under that system. No, if, if I were 50 years old in that system, I would already be a retired priest. In Numbers chapter 8, verses 23 through 25, the Lord said to Moses, this applies to the Levites. Men 25 years old or more shall come to take part in the work at the tent of meeting. But at the age of 50, they must retire from their regular service and work no longer. And so, as he's been saying, the Jews paid tithes to priests who would retire from ministry and ultimately die. But Jesus is the one true priest who is eternal, of whom Melchizedek is only a picture. And he's greater because he actually is still living. He's not a priest that eventually retires and dies. He's, his is the only priesthood that brings men to God and does so permanently. And that's the point he's making here. Because notice in verse 11 how he says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Uh, the law... Uh, was not something that was going to be able to bring people to a full relationship with God. And the priests who were uh, uh, ministering under the law couldn't do that. Uh, they couldn't bring them to a, to a uh, permanent relationship with God because offerings were made consistently and regularly. Uh, and every time the offering was made, it was a reminder of their sinfulness. And so the law was, was a schoolmaster preparing people for the one who could bring them permanently to God. So the Levitical priesthood failed to give men an adequate relationship to God because it didn't completely secure access to Him. Uh, securing access to God is actually the goal of Christianity. It's through Jesus Christ that you have a secure and permanent relationship with God. The law couldn't produce that for me. Only Jesus Christ could. That's why in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, Paul said, In Jesus we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. See, the law gave people God's requirements for a relationship with Him, but due to human frailty, it never could be obeyed completely. Just think about it for a moment. How many times have you ever wanted to do that which was right, desired to do the right kind of thing, but found yourself to be inadequate, incapable of doing so? I wonder if anybody in here has ever gotten to the point where you began to cry out like the apostle Paul did when he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I wonder if I have anybody in this room who's ever gotten to the point of frustration in your life where you have finally said, God, I can't do this by myself. I need your help. That's how I got saved. When I finally got to that point in my life where I said, I can't do this. I can't provide for myself, and I don't know anybody else who can. I don't have peace, and I don't have joy. I don't have love. I don't have any of those things that I desire, and I, I frankly don't know how I'm going to find those things. Well, that's what Jesus Christ provides for us. In the memorial services, in the, in the constant reminding of ourselves in the Jewish legal system where I would bring an offering to God, there was a constant reminder that I was falling short. Constantly, every time I brought an offering and every time I, I would make that offering to the Lord, there is a reminder that I am failing in my relationship with God. But Jesus Christ, on the other hand, makes an offering of himself one time for all time and through his blood I am cleansed, and now I have relationship with God through faith in him. And so the whole purpose of Christianity is to bring me and bring us to a permanent relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. I couldn't keep the law completely, and therefore the sacrifices had to be made on a daily basis. But Jesus is the one who makes that one time for all time sacrifice. So the priests in the uh, Old Testament picture could only only demonstrate reconciliation, uh, they can only present it as a picture through the offering of sacrifices to God. And sacrifices were inadequate because they couldn't bring permanent access. So they needed to know something. 
The Jewish readers needed to know, you can come to God. You can have a relationship with God. You need to know that. It's not something that's hidden from you. It's not something that is veiled any longer. They needed to be reminded and they needed to know, and they still do, that you can have a relationship with God, and that has been made possible through Jesus Christ. No longer do you have to go through the various rituals and all of that. You can finally just know Him. We have uh, contemporary things in our religious systems that are very reminiscent of the way that the Jews would, would see salvation. I was raised in a religious system that never gave to me any sense that I could actually know God on a permanent basis. I had to go through various rituals in order for me to have a sense of cleansing in order that I might be made presentable to God. And in my religious system, I basically had to have that as a renewed thing on a weekly basis. I was raised, as many in this fellowship, as a Roman Catholic. And for me, there was never presented, I never received in my uh, catechism training all the way to confirmation, I never received any sense that I could actually truly know God. Uh, I, I knew that there were possibilities of that, and I was aware of Jesus Christ being sent, but I was never trained properly, or perhaps I just didn't understand what was being taught at that time. But I, I knew that that, that God and I were not going to be very close because my sin made a separation. And so we had a, a, a thing that we would do, and some of you understand and, and did this yourself. We had our confessional system where on a Saturday you would go to confession and you'd go into that little, um, that little booth there. And, and uh, I, I discovered a number of things about that booth. I discovered that when you kneel down, a light goes off so people know somebody's in there. And the way I found that out is because I kept kneeling off and on, off and on. I get up and go down, and somebody finally opened the door and said, what are you doing? And they pointed out the light. Every time you stand up, the light goes off. And then when you kneel down, it goes back on, and you're confusing the people out here who want to come and pray. And then my thought was, well, if they're getting mad and they have another sin, that's just one more to confess when you get in here. So don't make a big deal about it. You ought to repent before you even come in here. But I was only like seven years old, you know, and I was just fascinated with that. And when you would kneel down and you'd look, in, you'd look into that little screen there and then you'd see the profile of the priest. And in my, in my uh, church, you know, there was one priest that I really never wanted to have, uh, you know, and I would be so afraid that Father McHugh would be there because he was the mean priest. And, and I'd see his profile and I'd go, oh, no, it's Father McHugh, you know. And then you would say, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It has been such and so time since my last confession. And you'd go through the whole nine yards. And, and he'd say, and, you know, what have you done? And I lied three times. You know, I, I had a bad thought four times. You know, I, you were supposed to enumerate our sins. And some of you know what I'm talking about. And you've got all of this. And, and any sin that you forget before you go in is, is, is going to be, you know, exonerated. It's okay because you forgot. So I would do my very best to forget as much as I could before I walked in there. And uh, I'm telling you. Then he says, you know, go out and do 10 rosaries or whatever. I mean, you know, I normally got, you know, maximum punishment. And then I'd go out and I'd do my, my penance and my prayers, my fa our fathers and acts of contrition and, and Hail Marys and all the rest. And then I'd get up and then I was in a state of grace for 24 hours. And so the next day I could go to Mass and I could stand up and I could climb in line and I could walk forward and receive the body and blood of Christ and... But then the cycle starts again right after, after service. Come Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday, I'm back to being a little rascal. And come Saturday, I've got to go back in there and face Father McHugh. And, and, and some of you know what I'm trying to say. There was never a sense of forgiveness. There was always a, a fresh start today, and then I have to start again next week. And then I have to start again next week. But there's never a sense of permanent relationship with God. Why? Because rituals will never bring you to a sense of a permanent relationship with God because in the ritual is the remembrance. Every time you have to go back to confession, it's another remembrance of your sinful condition. And I have to die in a state of grace because if I don't die in a state of grace, uh, receiving uh, the last rites and the whole nine yards, then I have no sense of, of hope that I'm going to enter in into heaven. And therefore, one of my great hopes is to marry a good, praying Catholic wife who's going to pray my soul out of purgatory, and that's the only hope that I really have for eternity is that somebody will hang around long enough after I die to get me out. 
I, I can, you know, do, do, does anybody know what I'm trying to say? Or is that is, yeah, yeah. Um, you know what I'm saying. And um, there was no sense of a permanent relationship with God because I didn't see the resurrected Christ. When I would walk into my church, um, St. Pius X Church in Santa Fe Springs, when I would walk in, I saw Jesus Christ portrayed as crucified on that cross. And all that my mind would go would be to the death of Christ on a cross. I didn't see the empty tomb. All I saw was the man dying. I didn't understand resurrection. I didn't understand that he's my high priest. I didn't understand that I could have a great and, and a permanent relationship with God through faith in him. I didn't know that because ritual gets in the way of relationship. And that's true in this portion of Scripture here. As, as the writer is saying to the Jews, you're wondering why Jesus is so important. And you're stumbled at the fact that he was not from the tribe of Levi. He was not a, a Aaronic priest, but uh, from the tribe of Judah. We'll see that in just a moment. And you're wondering how he could possibly be a priest, seeing that he didn't come out of the law from the proper tribe. Well, you need to understand that perfection never came through the Aaronic priesthood. Um, it, it, it never happened. It was only a picture, but never brought men to an adequate relationship with God. And the answer is going to be the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ one time for all time. Look with me for just a moment to chapter 10 here in Hebrews, and I'll show you that. Chapter 10, verse 10, Hebrews, where he says that. He says, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, by that uh, will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. One time for all time. When Jesus Christ died on that, Christ, on that cross, it was one time for all time. So sacrifices are inadequate because they do not bring permanent access to God. And that is made possible only through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's why we go through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one who brings us to a relationship with God. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 21, Paul said it this way. He said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ died in vain. It doesn't come through the law. It doesn't come through the rules and regulations and ordinances. It comes through faith in him. So they needed to know that they could have a direct access to God. They needed to know that they could be totally secure in Jesus Christ without ritual, without sacrifice. They needed to remember what those sacrifices were. You see, in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, Paul said, Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And again, I see parallels to this and my, my former religious faith. And I'm not here to, today, by the way, to, to, uh, to, to knock the Catholic Church, but that's the only history I have, and I use it by illustration, and hopefully you'll understand that. Because as I was growing up, we had holy days of obligation. There were days that you were obligated to go to church, and if you didn't, it was a mortal sin. Um, there were various things that, that would keep me in bondage. And I didn't understand that the, those kinds of things were inadequate and not necessary. Jesus Christ fulfilled every requirement of the law. Jesus Christ is the one who uh, made it possible for me to have a relationship with God. We used to have, a, when I was growing up, we uh, didn't eat meat on Friday. I mean, it was a bad thing for you to do that. You were supposed to eat something other than meat because uh, food uh, like, like chicken and, uh, and beef and fish were broken into three different categories. So you couldn't eat meat on Friday, but you could eat uh, fish. And, and uh, I didn't like fish, you know? And, and I can't tell you how many times I forgot it was Friday as I was eating that bologna sandwich. I mean, I, and my, a lot of times my mom would say, oh, we forgot it's Friday, and she was making a steak for my dad. I mean, it just, it was not adequate. All it did is it brought you into bondage, and those things don't make you closer to God. They didn't have the impact or the effect that people wanted it to have. And the rules and regulations don't do that. Jesus Christ is the substance. These things are simply a shadow. They are only pointing to him, but he's the reality. 
So we ask the question in verse 11, uh, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek? In other words, if the Levites could bring people to God, then why did God speak of another priesthood? God's word had spoken in Psalm 110, verse 4, of a priest that would not die. Because in Psalm 110, 4, it says, the Lord has sworn will not relent. You're a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So believing Jews need assurance that they are forever secure through Jesus Christ. In verse 12, he says, the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. Now, when he says the priesthood being changed, that word change speaks of exchange. It speaks of transferring. It speaks of putting one thing in place of another. So God's choice of another kind of priesthood is what he's speaking of. And he says, and God has chosen to use uh, the, an issue or the image of Melchizedek to give you the permanent uh, priesthood that his, that his son has. So Christianity is to clarify the religion of Judaism. It not only clarifies it, but you might find this interesting, but Christianity not only clarifies the religion of, of the Jew, but it, it also replaces the former religion of the Jew with the Christian faith. Now, that's a heavy statement to make, but Jewish believers needed to understand that faith in Christ replaced the religion of Judaism. If the priesthood is new after Melchizedek, so is the believer's relationship to the law of Moses. And a change in relationship to the priesthood would also mean a change with the law. Ritual requirements are now completely unnecessary. And what it is, is some are having a difficult time letting go. When I met a young lady by the name of Marie, she was coming to my Bible study. She came for a couple of months, and we began to date. She did not come with me to church on Sunday mornings. For the first several months of our dating relationship, Marie did not come with me on Sunday morning. Marie would go to Catholic church with her mom, and she would meet me at the church I would go to on Sunday nights. And she did that for months, going on for several months into almost the first, close to the first year of our dating relationship. By the way, I never told her, you shouldn't go here or anything like that. I never did. I simply met her at the church that I was going to, and I let the Word of God do what God's Word was going to do in her. But Marie was raised in a very strong Catholic family. I mean, uh, very strong. Her mom came into her room while she was asleep with holy water that she'd gotten at church, and she would sprinkle Marie with holy water, you know, just because that's what mom does, you know. And for her, it was a very special thing. And my mother-in-law's uh, love for her daughter and her Catholicism was very strong. And Marie carried that within her. I didn't say anything to her about that because I know the truth sets you free. But one day, um, I was at her place, and, and I, was, I opened, got her wallet, and I started looking at the pictures that she had in her wallet. And uh, I wanted to see if she had any of me. Uh, which she didn't. But anyway, <laughs> as I was looking at it, I said, I thought, I looked at her, and we'd been going for several months, and I said to her, I, I thought that, I thought you were my girl. She looks at me, and she goes, well, of course I'm your girlfriend. I said, no, you've got, you're, and I, I said, you, you've got a picture of another guy. She goes, I what? I said, you've got a picture of another guy. She goes, what are you talking about? You've got a picture of Joe. She said, Joe? I said, yeah. She said, what are you talking about? I said, you've got a picture of Joe. You're dating somebody else. She goes, let me see. Well, it was a picture of St. Joseph. And so I said, what's this? She says, oh, you know, she didn't let go of things. She had a little brown scapular that if she was wearing it at the time of death, she'd instantly go to heaven. I mean, this is a gal who used to have a statue of Joseph on her dashboard facing traffic. You know, and when she, you know, and his hands were over his eyes, you know, like, <laughs> you know, and uh, I mean, yeah, I can't take this anymore, you know. He prayed to himself to get, anyway, um, he melted. He looked like the hunchback of Notre Dame, you know, but it was supposed to be St. Joseph. I mean, there were a lot of things that she held on to and didn't release. So the whole thing is, is they need to know, look at you can have a relationship with God. Uh, you, you can let go. You don't have to hold on to these things. 
You don't have to have those statues anymore in your house. You don't have to carry the scapulars anymore. You don't have to go to sleep with the rosary when you're afraid that somebody outside might break it. You don't have to have those anymore. You can have a relationship with God, and they needed to understand that. So the point he's making is very simple. You have all that you need, and this, by the way, if, if we could get this in our hearts, would revolutionize our lives. You have all that you need in Jesus Christ. Now, if we knew that, our lives will really be transformed. I'm serious. If we absolutely said, you know, that's true. I have all that I need in Him. Well, if I knew that, my life will be transformed. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verse 10, how Paul said, you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He has made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Or 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Or Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So we have been given fullness in Christ. We have the righteousness of God in Him. We have everything we need for life and godliness, and we have every spiritual blessing, and all of this is in Jesus Christ. And that's the point that the writer is making to his Jewish readers. You need to understand that you have everything in Him, and rituals and all the rest is not satisfying and isn't going to take you where you want to go. You need to understand that. And so he says, a priesthood being changed, of necessity there's a change of the law. Verse 13, for he of whom these things are spoken uh, belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And so he says, Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. He's not from the tribe of Levi, and his, perm his priesthood is permanent. You know, in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, the Scripture says, One of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The Lion of the tribe of Judah. And so the Lord Jesus Christ is from the tribe of Judah, and He says that's who He's speaking about. In verse 15, And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, who has come, not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God." And so the point he's making is, is there's another priesthood. Uh, it, he speaks of, in verse 15, it is far more evident if in the likeness of a Melchizedek there arises another priest. That word another in the Greek is heteros. It speaks of uh, something of a different quality or kind. So in Jesus, we don't have a priest like Aaron. We don't have a priest like one of the temple priests. He's different because he's of a different order. He says in verse 16, uh, who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, when he speaks of a fleshly commandment, that speaks of physical requirements. His priesthood was not based on physical descent. It's not dependent on external law, but by the power inherent in his life. He says in verse 17, he testifies, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So Jesus as priest lives on forever. He is life, not just the means of obtaining it. I think sometimes we need to understand that, that in Jesus Christ is life. He is life. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, is what Paul says, he is the whole meaning of life, but he is the one who provides life because he is life itself. You see, in the priestly system, uh, there was a, a necessary method of, of uh, succession, but not with Jesus Christ. That's because Jesus has the power of an endless life. He never transfers his priesthood to anyone else. The uh, Levitical priest begins to minister at the age of 25, but retires at 50, ultimately dies, not Jesus Christ. He has the power of an endless life. He continues always. That's why 2,000 years after Jesus died and rose again, we still look to him as our priest. We still pray, and, and he makes intercession for us. That's why I can lift up my prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, knowing that he presents them to the Father. 
because he's alive. But he is the one who is alive. And the scripture makes that very clear throughout the Bible. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of men. In John 5, 26, as the Father has life in himself, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself. Or John eleven twenty five, 25, when Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Or in 1 John 1, 1 and 2, which says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked on and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life, the life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. We proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. All through the New Testament, we see Jesus Christ is presented as the one who is life. He's not just alive, he is our life. And so because he is alive, he, he has an endless priesthood. Therefore, I can speak to him now 2,000 years later, and I can say in the name of Jesus, Lord, I need this, or help me with that. And I know that he's there making intercession for me. When he says in verse 18, uh, on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness, the law, was made, uh, the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there's a uh, bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Uh, Aaron is replaced by Jesus. God set aside the old, imperfect, for the new, which is perfect. And so the old system could reveal sin, but it's powerless to remove it. I didn't know that I was a liar until I read the scripture that said, thou shalt not lie. I didn't know that I was a thief until I read the scripture which says, thou shalt not steal. And I began to be aware of all kinds of things that I saw as natural and normal that were in the Lord's sight actually sinful. The law can reveal to me what God expects but the law cannot perfect me because in the law is the reminder, but it doesn't restore completely and permanently. So God, knowing the weakness of human flesh, sent his son made in the likeness of flesh to go through everything that was necessary to perfectly obey in order that he could make it possible for me to have a relationship with God. You see, God has a standard of perfection. I can't reach, no matter how good I might think I am or perhaps how good you may think yourself to be. Now, a lot of people don't want to admit they're sinners. A lot of people don't want to admit that they're as bad off as they really are. I remember my mom was speaking to a woman on one occasion and sharing with her the gospel and and said to her um, some things, and the woman said, you know, I'd, I'd like to become a Christian. And as my mom was sharing with her, my mom said, well, if you want to pray with me to receive the Lord, thinking that she had communicated adequately, my mom began to pray, and she said, uh, okay, repeat after me, and, and let's pray, and, and you receive the Lord. And the lady said, okay, and bows her head, and my mom said, uh, God, forgive me, a sinner. And immediately the woman opens her eyes and looked to my mom and said, I'm not a sinner. So some people don't really understand the gravity of a sinful life, don't even understand that they are sinners. It amazes me, but it's true, and it's more so now than ever before. And so the law awakens in me the reality of the need for help by revealing to me that the things that I am experiencing that cause me great pain sometimes are actually sinful things. And God says, well, of course, you are, you are um, right now reaping the consequences of these decisions and behaviors because what you have done is you've lived a life in separation to me, and, and you don't have life within you. And so what you need is you need to repent, and you need to turn to me so that I can wash you, and as I wash you from your sin, then I can fill you with my spirit and enable you to have a new heart Take away that, that stony heart and place within it a living and, and fresh heart so that I can now write on the tablets of that heart my, my word and I can give to you the desire to do my will and bless your life. That's Christianity. And it's not ritual. It's not making sure that I go to church at a certain time or do a certain ritual thing at a certain time. It's having a relationship with God. 
The old system revealed sin, but it couldn't remove it. In Romans chapter 7, verse 7, Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law, for I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. So if it could not remove sin, it had to be replaced, and it had to be replaced by Jesus Christ. The law gives no security because it cannot cleanse a man's conscience. Jesus, his priesthood, brought men to Christ and, 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 and granted us access to God through him. The Old Testament saints only saw salvation from a distance, but Jesus brought salvation to man. And as he does that, man now has a clear picture of what is required of him and therefore can turn to the Lord and have a relationship with him. I'll give you one last scripture in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to verse 22. How the writer said, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Did you ever, have you ever? Now, as I look out, I see some who are young. Maybe you have yet to do this to any degree. I look out and I see some who are older. Perhaps you've done this. Have you ever? Just cried out to God in frustration, saying, Oh, God, I feel wretched. Oh, God, I need help. Have you ever done that? Oh, I have. You know, I have. Even as a believer, there have been times when God has been good enough to graciously reveal my own heart to me. And as I see it, I'm, I don't find it very attractive. And, and, and I've cried out, Oh, God, who's going to save me from this body of death? Oh, Lord, I need your help. I, I need your help. Because I, I can appear on the one hand, on the outside, I can appear to be a righteous person. But Lord, it's not the outer appearance that matters. It's the inner person of the heart. And unless you can take this, this heart and, 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 and break it and then heal it and, and then use it, then Lord, I just, I just don't know if I'm going to if I can do this. I just don't know if I'm going to go on with this. I need real life in me. And uh, I do that periodically. There are times when the Lord seems to weigh more heavily on me than at others, where I, I find myself, you know, needing to just get away with Him for a while and just to spend time with Him and talk to Him and share with Him and open my heart to Him. Because I don't want to be somebody who has the outer appearance of religiosity when in reality, uh, though my mouth says great swelling things, my, my heart is far from him. I, I pray that God gives uh, a, a real genuine sense of closeness to him, relationship with him, and uh, that's what he desires from us. And so we can have our hearts made new. We, we can have a true heart. We can have full assurance of faith because our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience. God's word cleanses us, and then we draw near to him, and we fall before him, and we say to him, God, thank you. Thank you for the life of Jesus Christ that has been imparted to me. Thank you that he kept all of your righteous commandments, that he has an ever-living priesthood, that he always lives to make intercession for me, that I can have relationship with you. Thank you that he is life, and, and he has granted to me to have life in him. And because of that, I can have a clean conscience. I'm not going to go out and exact a pound of flesh from myself. I'm not going to try and make up for all the sins that I have committed. I'm going to throw myself uh, upon you and ask for mercy and forgiveness, and I will receive it, for your word is stated, if I confess my sin, that, that you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, I receive from you that today, and I thank you for it, for you have washed me and you have cleansed me, and, and, and it's through the water of the word of God that you have made that so. And so that's the point that the writer is making to, to his Jewish readers. Don't go back to ritual. 
Don't go back to something that didn't fulfill. Understand that Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills all of the pictures that you find in the sacrificial system, and it's through Jesus Christ that you have access to God in relationship with him. So just draw near to him, enjoy him, and he will present you to the Father.